We looked at uh, low mass stars and you understood that when they burn helium at the center, they make carbon and oxygen that they will precisely keep in the white dwarf. So this is not the carbon and the oxygen that will go in the interstellar matter, but the one which will go into the interstellar matter is the one which is produced during the thermal pulses in, through helium burning in the shell, which is then dredged up by the convective envelope, brought to the envelope, and then expelled by the winds. Okay? The nitrogen itself, it's, uh, it's uh, also the same thing, but it's due to hydrogen burning. CNO makes a lot of nitrogen, so this is the way through the thermal pulses that you will enrich the envelope and then the, the material, the interstellar material through this nitrogen. But what was made at the center stays in the center. Okay? And because of this neutron capture on iron peak elements that were there when the star was born, you actually are able to make heavier elements. So as I said, it could be, this will be the end of the story for the sun. But what can happen else if you are not a single star? If you are actually with a companion, which is most of the stars actually, they, have, uh, they are formed in clusters and they are formed in, in binaries actually, then what can happen is the following. So one of the stars is going to be more massive than the other one. Let's say this is this one. And this is the smaller mass companion. So you remember, the more massive, the fastest the star evolves. Okay? So the most massive one eventually will come uh, to, to, be a, to be a white dwarf, while the other one is still, for example, it's low mass star, it's a lower mass, so it might still be burning hydrogen in the center. But at some point, this star will evolve also and will eventually become a red giant. So the, the, the radius of the star is going to inflate, and depending of, on the orbits and how close these two stars are, you might have some deposition of the material by the red giant onto the white dwarf. And when you do that, so you have an accretion disk, this white dwarf, the mass is going to increase. And at a certain mass, which is called the Chandra Zekar mass, you will have actually a detonation. So you have a supernova which will occur. And this is what is called supernovae type 1. And uh, so this can happen also if you have two white dwarfs which, uh, which uh, uh, merge, you can also have this, this, uh, this supernovae type 1. And this makes beautiful objects like, like this one, where you have the ejecta that goes at very, very high speed and uh, that have a lot of uh, hard X-ray, etc. around it. When you have such a star, it's some, some people try to look for the companion. So here you have one example, this one, this supernova here. And once the luminosity decreases, you look for the companion and you see here the companion was found, was found uh, a few years uh, later. So it was the proof that it was really a supernova type 1A. What is interesting is this supernova is, is different things. So what, what will happen in terms of, of nucleosynthesis is that you will actually have carbon and oxygen core will actually undergo a nuclear reaction, so you will be able to make nickel uh, 56 and then also uh, some, uh, some iron. And you will also produce these oxygen, silicon, silicon, etc. elements. And you see, you can produce a lot of this material. So a star which, depending on its mass, but uh, eight solar mass star can produce almost one solar mass of this kind of, uh, of elements during this, uh, this detonation. And here you have the spectrum of one of these stars where you see iron, silicon, and, uh, and calcium, for example, which are made during this phase. What is extremely interesting also for this star is that the detonation is going to occur when the star has this Chandra Zekar mass, 1.45 solar masses. So that means that almost all these explosions, these detonations, will give rise to the same luminosity. So the luminosity of the star is going to increase. You will have a peak here and then a decrease, a decay. And you can see that this curve is very well explained. This luminosity curve is very well explained by the combination of the decay of nickel first. And then you have the cobalt, which actually takes over. 
Okay, so you see this. This is uh, this is uh, how we explain by uh, this very high luminosity by the decay of these two uh, radioactive elements. So because you always get more or less the same luminosity around here, when you see a type 1a supernovae and you are able to identify through its spectrum that it has these and that abundances, you can say it's a type 1a supernovae. You can determine the luminosity you get from Earth. This star is going to be distant, is distant, so you don't see it with the brightness that it has in real life, but you know actually what its what is lum actual luminosity is. And then you can deduce the distance of this object. You compare the luminosity you get from the luminosity which is the one of a supernova type 1a. And this is what we call a standard candle. It's a way to determine the distances in the universe, actually. So there are different ways to determine the distances of stars. You can use parallaxes. You can use uh, cepheids, which are stars also which have luminosity, which oscillate. It was, uh, it was uh, found by Henrietta Levitt. Uh, and you can also use, so the further you go, the brightest the, 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 the object you need to, to, to measure the distances. And actually, these, uh, these supernovae, type 1a, they are used at twat di distances to determine uh, the distances of galaxies. And through this way, you can also determine by looking at the spectrum, you can determine the redshift of the galaxy. So both the distance and the speed at which the galaxy goes far away from you. And actually looking at this, uh, at this, uh, this kind of object was used by, uh, by some colleagues, by different colleagues which are here. So Pellmutter, Schmidt and, and um, Weiss actually. And they actually used these supernovae at very large distance not only to measure the distance, but also to show that the universe was not only in expansion, but that this expansion was accelerating. So this is this kind of star, low mass stars at the end of their life that have the chance to have a companion that makes them detonate, make a supernovae of a given type with which you can measure the distance. And with that, you can measure not only the distance of the galaxy, but the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. That's nice. And it's stellar evolution. There is some uncertainty on this uh, luminosity, actually. And also there are some debate about is it always the same way it, it, exists, it, it works. But this is the basic of, uh, of how you use stellar evolution, you know, to make cosmology. One way. There are many others. Okay, so when you, when you have this white dwarf exploding uh, thanks to its companion, you can make all these blue elements that, uh, that you have here, actually. And you see that there is a lot of iron which is produced in the type, two, in the type 1a supernovae. And actually, two-thirds of the iron which is made is in the universe is made by Loma stars at this phase, if they have a companion and explode as supernovae type 1a. So it's not the massive stars who make most of the, the iron, it's this low mass star. And why is it so? Why do we have so much? First, uh, you saw that the quantity of iron which is uh, expulsed is, is, uh, is very high. But also, the low mass stars actually, they are the most uh, numerous in the universe. The massive stars, they are extremely rare, while the low mass stars, they are much more numerous. So if you have a lot of, uh, of uh, ma low mass stars, even if they die quite late, and even if you have only, let's say, even 10% of binaries, they will still be the ones that produce the most of the iron in the universe. Let's say this is it for the low mass stars, and let's move now to massive stars. So massive is roughly above eight solar masses. So this is uh, around above eight solar masses. So this is the HR diagram, uh, effective temperature, luminosity. Now this is a theoretical one. Here you have, uh, in, uh, so you have some evolution tracks of stars of different masses. The masses are given here. And here the edge uh, region is the uh, main sequence. Uh, so this is where the stars will stay most of their life. And then they will move to, this, uh, to these regions here. And you see that the massive stars they have very strange shapes, actually, and they, ha they have very, very peculiar morphology. This is a Wolf Rayet, 
with a lot of material being lost by the star, which is not yet a supernova. Here you have uh, Eta Carine, which has a, a companion, and uh, we will see in more detail later, but it has some blobs, and uh, it uh, ejected a lot of material. Uh, 200 uh, years ago, actually, it ejected one, ma one solar mass, and we can, we can measure that by looking at the blobs and their expansion velocity. Okay, and uh, these are also very complicated objects. This is, uh, this is a simulation. These are very complex objects. Co there is convection and, and many things that go on. Uh, and it's not only what happens in the core, which is important, but it's also these kind of things. But first, for the nucleosynthesis, let's go to the core. So this is a diagram we have seen a couple of times, which shows you the, the temperature at the center of the star as a function of the central density. This is for the same models than those we were looking at here. Okay, it's from the same calculation. And you see that in this regime, so above eight solar masses, you will not enter this degeneracy regime. So the electron uh, won't compensate the, the, the gravitational uh, uh, contraction. And you will be able to move all along this, uh, this line and to burn at the center of the star the elements one after the other. And it so it starts by burning hydrogen at the center, as it was in the low mass star. This is here the main sequence. Then it will contract reach the temperature for helium burning. We will have helium burning as we had before. And then the core can keep contracting and heating. The, the pressure and the temperature is like a, an ideal gas, so you still have the, the relationship between, pressure, uh, between uh, temperature, pressure, and density. And you can contract until you reach the next uh, burning phase, next meaning in terms of central temperature, because you need higher and higher temperature to fuse heavier and heavier elements. I won't repeat hydrogen and helium, we have seen previously, so it's exactly the same thing. Uh, except that in massive stars, it's not going to be PP chains, it's going to be CNO, but okay, it doesn't matter much. And then, uh, once uh, carbon is produced at the center, carbon and oxygen actually is produced at the center, you will start the fusion of carbon. Uh, and when we say start the fusion of carbon, it's not only carbon, it's all the other elements that might be around also, which might capture particles and, and, and do other things. So here you have uh, carbon plus carbon gives uh, magnesium 24. And actually it will make, uh, so this is an unstable element and you will make uh, uh, actually, what did I say magnesium 24 is, an no, it's not unstable. Uh, but you can, you can actually uh, make some uh, neon fo photo disintegration of magnesium because you have uh, uh, very high energy photons here. So you can photo disintegrate the magnesium 24, make neon 20. It's just being able to count how many, uh, pro uh, how many protons you add to your, next, to your nuclei and then you get the next one, okay? And actually there will also be some uh, oxygen 16 which will be produced. What I forgot to say is that now you see the temperature have to be extremely high, okay? So we started with 15 million K to, make, to burn hydrogen. To burn helium, you need around 80, 100 million K. But to burn carbon, you need to reach 600 million K and very high density. And the main products will be oxygen 16, neon 20 and magnesium 24. So I will try the exercise to explain you this figure, okay? This is uh, a plot of the central part of a 20 solar mass star. So I'm looking only at the core. The core is here. Here you have 10 solar masses and the surface would be here. And here, this is the structure, the chemical structure of the star after you have burned carbon. You see that at the center, so the central two solar masses, you have produced oxygen 16 and neon 20 and some magnesium 24, okay? And you see you have done that using the carbon. So the carbon is actually the, the, this, this uh, dot line here and you actually uh, deplete the, the carbon 12. This carbon 12 which is used to, to make the, the oxygen. So the carbon 12 is not, is not there anymore. 
But in the shell around this, you have some carbon-12, so you can see the dotted line here, which is due to the fact that around the core, you still have the helium burning in a shell. Here you have the helium, the, its abundance is here, and you see it drops here. And this is the hydrogen burning shell, actually, where you produce carbon-12. If you go in the more external part, here you have hydrogen, and you see hydrogen actually drops, and this is the hydrogen burning shell, which produces helium-4. And you see this is really the most central part of the star which, uh, which is doing this burning. And outside, if nothing happens, you still have the initial abundances, so you're not informed of what happens inside the core. So now we have, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, neon, oxygen, and magnesium-24, and uh, once it's finished at the very center, again, the core contracts. Temperature and density increase and you reach eventually this uh, above 1 billion K. Very high density. And what happens is that here you have, you don't have fusion, but you have a lot of uh, high energy photons which are going to photo disintegrate the, the neon. So you see you break the neon through photo disintegration. You release some alpha particles, you make some oxygen 16, and these alpha particles can be captured by, by other elements. Then the next step, so you have made a lot of oxygen at that phase, and the next step is actually oxygen burning, which also requires much higher temperature. I'm going a little bit fast in this, in this uh, thing because I don't think it's necessary to look at all the reaction. The idea is to see, okay, I'm finished, I don't have this uh, nuclear energy anymore, gravity takes over and then boops, the core contracts, heats up, and then we can move to the next burning. But then oxygen-16 is going to, to burn. Also, you see 2 billion K. Uh, 2 billion K is required, and here you have a step of one order of magnitude in density. And these are the main products. You will actually produce some, some silicon, for example. So after that, at the very center, you will have some, uh, again, uh, very high energy photon, which will photo disintegrate this, uh, this uh, silicium and also magnesium, etc. So you will release a lot of alpha elements. At, in principle, there you don't have any uh, helium, you don't have alpha particles anymore. But because you photo disintegrate these elements, you have a lot of alpha particles, which can, which can fuse with other elements at very high temperature. So that makes a very interesting nuclear synthesis. And through this very complex nuclear network, what you get at the end of the day is nickel and, and iron. Photo disintegration and alpha captures go up to these uh, these very high uh, uh, these very heavy elements. So the net products will be will be mostly uh, nickel and and, uh, and iron. So this is uh, this is uh, uh, a diagram that shows you the evolution again a Kippenan diagram. So you. You have the, the mass of the star. This is a 15 solar mass star here in, um, in ordinate. And here the abscissa is the evolution with time. OK, and we are going to follow. So you see the this is the main sequence. You have hydrogen burning to helium at the center. And then you move to helium burning. And then the next figure shows you the inner five solar masses. And here you see carbon burning to oxygen and neon, oxygen to silicium, and silicium to iron at the center. But what you see on top of that are these uh, green areas where you actually have the shells of burning also. So here around the uh, carbon burning core, you have a helium burning shell and a hydrogen burning shell. And here you make oxygen, etc. And, and also nitrogen. And you see that when you move with time, you have these shells surrounding uh, the core. So you have not only core burning, but also shell burning. And this gives rise to this uh, onion uh, image that you all have seen probably, that you have actually at the very center, you have this uh, iron and, and nickel core surrounding by different shells of burning and things are going, keep going and increase the, the mass of, uh, of, the, of the core. So we have, uh, at that time, we have a huge star and a very small core radius, still 5,000 kilometers. You will see that later on it will shrink. 
when you will have the, the supernova explosion, but you see that you have something which is uh, five, uh, 5,000 kilometers in radii in the middle of the star that has the, the size of the distance between the Sun and Jupiter. So the, the external part of the star is extremely loose. Huh? It's kind of free-floating envelope, uh, and there can be some mass loss also during that phase. So before talking about the mass loss, I would like to give you the, the, the time scale, the, an idea of the time scale. So you remember the, the nuclear burning, uh, the time scale for nuclear burning, hydrogen is inversely proportional to the mass uh, to 10 to the 5. So this is this, uh, this hydrogen, sh uh, hydrogen uh, phase here. And for 15 solar mass star, you find it's around uh, one to, uh, 10, excuse me, 10 million years. Okay, 10 billion years for the Sun and 10 million years for this 15 solar mass star. This is determined through models. Huh? Okay, then the helium uh, is much shorter. Uh, and then when you go to the other phases, it's shorter and shorter. There are different reasons for that. One reason is that you are actually, the fuel that you have is less and less abundant because you have to go deeper and deeper into the core. And the other reason is that when you have these nuclear reactions, you release a lot of neutrinos. And these neutrinos, they will actually not interact with the matter, so they, tr they, they export a lot of energy, which leads to the further and further contraction. So it's not the nuclear reactions only counterbalancing the gravitational uh, contraction of the star, but in addition you have a lot of energy which is lost by the neutrinos and that speeds up also the evolution of the star, making the last phases extremely short. So you see oxygen burning from this model is something like two, two or three years, silicon is a, f is a few days, and then for the iron core collapse it's one second. Okay, And this is mostly due to the rare effect rarification of, of the fuel and also from the from neutrino losses. So as I was saying, these stars, they have uh, very uh, extended uh, envelopes and they are losing a lot of mass. And uh, to show you that, for example, uh, this is Betelgeuse, so you, you, you can see it. So this is the Orion Nebula here. And uh, here, this very red star uh, on, uh, on top of the Orion uh, um, uh, um, constellation, which has nothing to do <laughs> with, the, with the nebula, uh, is uh, Betelgeuse. So this is a red giant star, uh, pre-supernova. So some of my colleagues hope that this star will explode before themselves they die. Uh, it's totally uncertain. That could happen every day. Huh? Uh, but uh, So this is the ninth uh, brightest star in the sky. It has this temperature. It's very cool outside very extended, so the, the, the photosphere is extremely cold. You see the radius here, and here you can compare uh, Betelgeuse to other, so the Sun is here, Sirius is here, and you see actually it's a, it's a very huge star. And there were some observations uh, uh, by different uh, teams using uh, different instruments where you could actually measure the, the, the mass loss, uh, the mass loss uh, in, uh, around this object. So this is not the star itself, it's a model of the star, which has a lot of convection uh, outside. But what you see outside here are actually the, the, the extension, is the extension of the, of the envelope of the star, which is actually uh, processed. And here, uh, this, is the, this is, you cannot see, but this is Neptune. I was saying that we don't have theory for, for mass loss. There are some empirically based uh, models, etc. But what we do is, again, to um, observe stars and uh, use these, uh, these mass loss. So what you see here, this is, uh, this is Eta Carinae, the famous that should explode. This is a luminous blue variable. It's in this region. And you see that it can lose a lot, a lot of, uh, of mass. Uh, so you have the, the value here in terms of, uh, of uh, solar masses per year. And I was wrong when I said it, it expels one solar mass uh, a few years ago. Actually, it was 10 solar masses that was ejected in these blobs uh, in uh, 18, uh, 1840. Okay.
And here you have a Wolf Rayet, they lie in this area actually, and uh, they have this, uh, this uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of mass loss. If you have this amount of mass loss, you will actually peel off your star. And while you have the nuclear burning at the center, you will eventually so peel off the star and you will also put towards the, the envelope the material that has burned in the shell. So when the star evolved before the supernovae, they lose a lot of material that has been processed in the shells of the star. And when we look at these wolf Rayet stars, there is a sequence of, uh, of uh, abundances. So we see uh, the products of hydrogen burning. In particular, we see nitrogen. These are the uh, uh, wolf what we call WN stars, because in their spectrum you see nitrogen, which comes from hydrogen burning through the CNO. And then if you look at stars at, at other phases, you start to see carbon in their spectrum. And this is because you peel off the star and you, you, uh, you exhibit the, the results of the helium burning shell. So the carbon goes into space. Okay? And really by looking at these stars, you have a way directly to measure what, if your models are correct, or not, if the abundances you predict or the nuclear synthesis you make is correct on, or not. Most of the time the models are wrong actually because it's much more complex than nuclear synthesis. You have also rotation of the star, these stars they rotate quite fast. So they have ways to transport the chemicals from the places where they are made to other places and it makes very strange mixtures. And is also one of the, of the a uh, very important field now in, in uh, stellar physics to try to understand how these processes change the abundances beyond the nucleosynthesis. But this is how we probe also the, the models. Uh, you remember we have seen this, uh, this figure at the very beginning of the lecture, where you see here the binding energy uh, of the different elements per nucleon as a function of the mass number. And uh, I told you that uh, iron is, is the, the uh, most uh, stable element. Meaning that if you want to go to the other elements, you're not able to make it through fusion. You need to do it in another way. And in particular, you need to have some neutrons, as we had in the Loma stars, that will actually be able to enter the nucleus and to make heavier and heavier elements. So above this, this phase, you won't be able to fuse the iron and make heavier elements. And on top of that, actually, all the iron and the nickel that you have made there will remain in the neutron star. So all the things that these massive stars have done until yet, all the iron that these stars have made until yet, will forever stay in the remnant and won't be expelled in the interstellar matter. It's not during their first evolution that they make this, this iron. So how do they do that? Uh, so, in this case, we, have, uh, we eventually have, depending on the mass of the star, this, uh, this iron core, actually, which is uh, sustained by, uh, by, uh, some, by the uh, degeneracy pressure uh, and, uh, of, of the neutrons, actually. And you will have this, uh, this core, which is going to, to start to contract. So, here, to contract, here you have the time. Time zero is the moment where this, uh, this starts, uh, this contraction. And at that time, you have a core which is about the Earth's size, okay? Roughly these uh, 5,000 uh, kilometers we were uh, seeing before. And because you don't have any pressure anymore, you, this, this is going to collapse very quickly at very high speed. Uh, so um, this core is going to contract. So you see at certain point you reach something like 30 kilometers. And you still have the material which is... Uh, which is um, falling on this, uh, on this core. And at some point, when you reach twice the density of, uh, of the atomic nucleus, the collapse will stop because of the very strong nuclear force, which will actually uh, stop, stop the collapse. And you will have a shock wave, which will move outwards uh, this region. So you see here, this is a zoom on, on this part. So at that point, you have, uh, you have a, a much smaller core. And on this core, the accretion continues because the external parts, they still fall at their own velocity. So this, this, uh, this accretion 
uh, is up to 0.1 solar masses per second. It's a lot of material which is, uh, which is uh, falling onto, onto this region. And this will actually block the expansion of the shock wave. You have kind of a stagnation of, of the shock wave at that time. And when the core is about 10 kilometers uh, large, you have uh, this uh, magic uh, Chandra Zekar mass, where you will have a lot of, uh, the, the physics is totally different now inside this, uh, this soup of, uh, of uh, elementary particles, and you will have the emission of, of neutrinos and their uh, antiparticles, which will actually start to lead the uh, expansion of the, of the shock wave. So this is also one of the very open questions. This is a very schematic thing that I'm showing you, but actually uh, in, in the models it's, it's uh, extremely much more complicated. But what we think is that because of this wind of neutrino, there will be the expansion of, again of the, of the core. I won't go into the details. They are this is not my specialty, as you can understand, because I explain maybe not uh, very well, but uh, just to say that it's extremely complex. You have this wind of neutrino, there, there is a lot of energy produced in this region, so you have a lot of instabilities that pop up, rotation, etc., and it's very complex. And there are some people who have been trying for decades now to make these simulations in 2D, 3D, and it's, uh, it's very complicated to, to launch the, to launch the, the shock wave. But anyway, this happens because we see supernovae, co-collapse supernovae, and this happens very quickly in 0.3 seconds from the very beginning where the, where the core starts. In 0.3 seconds, you actually uh, are able to uh, eject, to make this shockwave propagate in the outer regions. And eventually, two hours later, the shockwaves will reach the surface and you will be informed as an observer when you will see the, the supernova explosion. During that phase, we again have a very special nucleosynthesis. It's like in the low mass stars, actually, where when we had these two shells, etc. Here, in this case, we have the material that has been produced in, in the surrounding of the core, which is going to be submitted to different, uh, different processes. And uh, in particular, we will have so the neutrino, which will, uh, which will, move, uh, which will move outside. This, uh, this neutrino wind is going to reach the surface of the, of the proto-neutron star. So here, in 10 seconds, you will have the uh, anti-neutrinos uh, and the electrons, which will be captured by the protons, and this will make a neutron excess. And here we go again with neutrons. Okay, because of these processes, we have neutrons, which are available. And uh, these, uh, neutrons, these neutrons, they will actually interact with the other elements which are around. And again, through different reactions, you will have a possibility to make first the iron peak. So we have these alpha particles that interact with the other elements. So you have again uh, this carbon, oxygen, etc., burning which occurs. And the neutrons, they will be captured by the iron peak element and, uh, and they will also make uh, some heavy elements. So this is also a neutron capture process. Here we call it air process for rapid. So that means that the flux of, of neutron is extremely high. In the case of the low mass star, we call it S because it's slow. The, the neutrons are released uh, more quietly. And that means that you will reach the elements in the, in the periodic table a little bit differently. Uh, what is important also is that here during that phase, you will also make these iron peak elements and you will actually produce also some iron. But during the explosion, again, the iron that you have made before stays in the core, but you can make through the, the nucleosynthesis when the shock wave passes and the neutron, pass, the neutron and, and, the anti and the neutrino pass here, you can actually make some iron. And you remember the supernovae type 1a, so the numbers change from one slide to the other, but that's the order of magnitude which is important. They make actually one type 1a supernovae makes 10 times more than the core collapse supernovae of iron. So I realized that my numbers must be wrong because I said two third, one third, I have to recount for a bit, okay. But anyway, so one third of the iron is produced during the type 1, uh, Type 2 supernovae, core collapse supernovae. 
So uh, exploding uh, massive stars in green now, you see you, you make, uh, you make uh, these elements here. You see, actually, we don't go very, very far away in the table. But again, this is for a single star. Now, if you are a massive star with a companion, you, make some, you can make something different, actually. And something different is going to happen with your neutron, neutron star. So, uh, in the questionnaire, uh, I was asking to you when the, the neutron was discovered, was in 1931. And this is also the time where, uh, where Lando made the hypothesis of uh, that the end uh, of the life of the star could be the neutron star, actually, thinking about this contraction effect and how the material will actually uh, reorganize itself. He proposed that there could be uh, some, um, at the end of the day, the stars could finish as, uh, as neutron stars. And uh, a neutron star, as this is ex extremely dense, actually, when you say the numbers, it doesn't really tell you something, but you see one spoon of a neutron star would be uh, 900 times the mass of the pyramid here. Okay, it's pretty dense and compact. Huh? Um, and uh, a few years after this proposition, uh, Bad and Zwicky proposed that the neutron stars, they could be actually uh, the, the result of the explosion of the, of the supernovae. So the supernovae could be the transition from ordinary stars to neutron stars. This was quite visionary actually and, and, and very interesting uh, also. So the only picture of one of these people who made science that I show is the one of Jocelyn Bell. Uh, so this is the Jocelyn Bell Burnell actually discovered the pulsar. So the pulsar is a neutron star which is uh, rotating very quickly and which emits some uh, regular uh, signal. Although this was, uh, this was uh, expected, it was discovered only 30 years later actually, that, uh, or 40 years later, th that these stars were actually uh, existing. And why am I showing the, figure of the picture of Jocelyn Bell? is because she was a PhD student at that time. She discovered this, uh, this thing. And uh, after that, she got pregnant. She had a maternity uh, leave. And uh, the guy who got the Nobel Prize was actually her PhD advisor. <laughs> so if you want to talk about uh, how to deal with your PhD advisor, you can come to me. It's also a subject I'm very interested in. And <laughs> they are nice PhD advisors, but uh, of course. <laughs> so, but now she's a very famous astronomer, actually, and uh, she's, she was as noblished by the Queen, but okay, the Nobel Prize went to the guy, okay. Uh, and then later on, very important for my story, was the discovery of binary pulsars. Very, very uh, late, uh, much later, actually, we had the first evidence of two neutron stars merging through these gravitational wave experiments, so these, uh, these uh, LIGO and Virgo experiments, which are uh, looking, searching for these uh, gravitational waves resulting from the merger of different types of objects, uh, neutron stars, uh, black holes, supermassive black holes, etc. And this was discovered a few years ago, actually, this, uh, this Kilo Nova, and uh, it was uh, propose that actually it's during that time that you can make the heavier elements like gold and platinum through the merger of these neutron stars. So actually when you merge the neutron stars you can populate this part and compete with the, with the low mass stars during the HEB phase. So find the supernova now. And why am I showing this one? It's because, you know, the massive stars, they evolve very quickly, a few million years. So if you look at a galaxy like this one and you see supernovae, that means that these are regions where you have star formation. Huh? These are, so while this supernova, so this massive star has gone through these phases a couple of million years, a low mass star like the sun is still forming, and, okay? So when you want to look for uh, regions of star formation, you, have to, you can use these kind of things. Of course, you can use infrared and, and do different things, but that's one way 
the, to, to track uh, star formation, so they are here. Nuclear sources, nitrogen, hydrogen burning, carbon and oxygen, helium burning in massive stars. And these, uh, these uh, elements around here, uh, sodium, neon, uh, carbon and neon burning. Here you have oxygen burning. Here this is the, the explosion of the, of the supernova. And here you have the heavy elements only through neutron, neutron capture. And this because of this binding energy, which is the key to understand this, these things. Okay? And you are lucky because when you mix elements and you release neutron, then you can capture this neutron and make this, uh, this uh, heavy element. And hydrogen and helium, I haven't talked about uh, primordial nuclear synthesis, but I will in a moment. And there are some elements which are produced by different processes that we can talk if you want during the week. You understand that we have very simple, that we have four equations of stellar structure, plus some equations to uh, compute the nuclear reactions, and, but we need to treat a lot of physical processes. Radiative transfer, the equation of state, the nuclear reaction rates, the opacity, and on top the, the stars, there are highly magneto-hydrodynamical objects. So you have all kinds of things that, an, that can op occur. Here you have the internal structure of a star which is rotating. The rotation actually flattens the star, changes the temperature inside the star, and this leads to very strong meridional currents that actually mix the star. And when you have this occurring, you have also some uh, layers that rotate at different speeds, so that leads to some turbulence. You have some instabilities. I will show one at the end of my lecture, which are very important. These stars, they have convection regions, which actually bump on the radiative region and generate internal waves. These waves, they are also transporting angular momentum and they also transport the chemicals eventually. The magnetic fields play a strong role also because they can break the, the rotation of the star, make it rotate differently. The convection is uh, something we treat with, uh, with one parameter, the convection in stars, okay? And uh, it's extremely, uh, extremely difficult to, to, to model indeed. The mass loss, I mentioned several times, we can have tides also that can also make some uh, different things. There can be some mergers, so you see, when I tell you we get this quantity from the stars, okay, how much? It's, a, it's another story. And as I said, you observe the abundances and for that you need to, to, to use a model of the atmosphere, which is also extremely complicated. Okay, but at some point you have to say, okay, I don't know everything, but I have to compare and do what I have to do. Okay, so in a nutshell, the chemical evolution, the basis. So you have stars which do all these things, and then they eject the material into the interstellar medium. Uh, oops. And then you will have these dense molecular clouds that will form, out of which you will make stars. Here you have a star forming here, here, here. Okay, and this is very dense. This is one light year, the size of, this, uh, of these guys, okay? And then, out of this, you have only 3% of the material which is going to turn to stars. This is what we call the star formation efficiency. So this is for the interstellar matter in the, in the, in the galaxy. But on top, these stars, they can expose the material very strongly and very far away. So you can have also some winds out of the galaxy. So you lose part of this material. Some is going to come back. Some is going to be lost in the intergalactic medium. And if you have a companion, then you can also merge and do different things. Star formation efficiency, very low. We don't form much stars in uh, interstellar medium. Something that I mentioned also before is that the interstellar matter forms many more low mass stars than massive stars. This is uh, uh, in logarithm here. Okay, so you have actually very few of those guys and a lot of these ones. So this is the distribution of the, how the matter goes when you have a star formation region. So you have actually almost half that goes to brown dwarfs, this guy that won't do anything in terms of nucleosynthesis. You have a lot of these low mass stars between 20 times uh, the mass of Jupiter and 0.8 solar masses, which are quite <coughs> numerous. 
Then you have these sun-like stars, so what I call the low mass star is, is these guys, and then a massive star, you see, it's, uh, it's very little. And now if you turn to the, the remnants, the brown dwarfs will stay brown dwarfs, the white dwarfs, you see, will be the majority, and the neutron stars and the black holes, they will be very, very minor. Okay? And this, uh, this is also important for evolution. That you understood, the more massive the star is, the shorter its lifetime. So when you make chemical evolution, you have to take that into account. When is my star going to die? And when is it going to contaminate my, my galaxy? Okay, so you have to take into account when you do galactic chemical evolution model, these lifetimes, not only the yields, but also the lifetimes to make it, uh, to, to compute it. So at the end of the day, that this is what, uh, what you get, some, uh, some predictions. So this, uh, in, uh, in astronomy, we, uh, we, we use this, uh, this uh, quantity to, de to um, uh, give the abundances of the elements. So this is iron and zero, this is with respect to the sun. So zero is the solar abundance. And here zero also. And here you see the mass fraction of, of different elements as a function of iron over hydrogen. So in principle, even though it's not always uh, so strict like that, time goes in this direction. So you start with metal poor galaxy and then you increase with time because you, you expel this material and you enrich the galaxy with these new products. Okay, so time more or less goes into that direction. So what do you see? Maybe you recognize the, the uh, products of oxygen. So here you have oxygen. And you see that oxygen at the beginning of the evolution of the, of the galaxy is quite high. Why? It's because it's made of massive stars which are very short-lived. So now when you make the ratio oxygen over iron, the iron, remember, they come from type 1a supernovae. So you need to have your low mass stars dying much later. And when that happens, you increase the, the iron actually and the ratio oxygen over iron uh, decreases. And you see the models don't do too bad. Here you have fluorine. So we have very few data, but you see if you include rotation or not, so these are the two curves, you can either produce the fluorine in the low mass stars, which come very late, or you can make it in massive stars. It's pretty uncertain. There are other elements for which uh, you have a lot of uncertainty. Here, look at, uh, at titanium. The models are totally wrong, actually. Or don't ex I forgot to say, of course, the small points are data. Okay, abundances of stars in, uh, in the surrounding of the, of the, of the, so in the solar neighborhood, so in our galaxy. So for the Loma stars, you see the nitrogen here. So we predict that nitrogen comes from low mass stars, but you see that we have a lot of nitrogen earlier on. And it's probably due to the fact that these massive stars, they were rotating very fast and they were able actually to dredge up this nitrogen from hydrogen burning very early on. So when you include rotation in your model, you get very different results. Scary, huh? But this is, I mean, if we had everything correct, it wouldn't be fun anymore. Okay, uh, so you, you understand the, the idea, I guess, and I will uh, just... Uh, well, there are some cases where it works pretty well, you see copper here. Okay, it's made in, in low and intermediate mass star, so I won't repeat that for all these things. And there are also very interesting things that can happen. So this is a, a movie that was uh, made a, a couple of years ago. So I'm coming back to Gaia satellite. So the Gaia satellite has measured the distances of stars in the galaxy, trying to make a 3D. Huh? And this has also been, it has also been able to capture the motion of, the different, of different streams within the galaxy. And we could recognize, uh, for example, some material that came from other galaxies when the Milky Way has interacted with some dwarf galaxies. And here you will see, you will see in this movie the Sagittarius dwarf which will approach to the Milky Way and which will actually uh, generate 
some star formation. When you have these two galaxies that actually pass next to each other, you are going to excite the gas and you will make a lot of star formation. And this is interesting because here you see the, the, the star formation. Look, puff. You have the first and here you have a peak in star formation. And then it goes away, it comes back and poof, another one. And it goes like that. Okay. So it's not only your stars evolving and your gas being depleted, it's also your companion that might actually lead to some star formation. It's amazing. And actually these people, they sold this, uh, this uh, idea. If you, I don't know if you noticed the time. So you will see the, the first. Uh, here, this peak here, five giga year ago. And of course, they sold that to nature to say, oh, the sun might have been created because the galaxy has uncultured the, 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 the Sagittarius dwarf. Don't publish in nature. <laughs> you will cut that, huh? publish in science, etc. But uh, OK, but that's interesting, actually. So for the philosophy uh, part that we will see, it's also something else that has to be sort of. So now I will show you another movie. You might have seen this, uh, this uh, uh, nice uh, measurement of the CMB. Who knows about the cosmic microwave background? A little bit? Okay. So to make it short, you have uh, the, the Big Bang occurring, the expansion of the universe, and there is a time where the universe becomes transparent after something like uh, 300,000 years. And when the, uh, when the universe comes transparent, you see these photons. And this is actually what is detected in this image, this cosmic mac uh, microwave background, more or less. These are fluctuations of temperature that uh, people extrapolate, blah, blah, blah. But so this is, we could say, the first image we could do of the universe. Okay. And you see there are some different colors which are indicative of different of uh, variation of the temperature locally, temperature and density. And these fluctuations are the ones which are going to lead, which are going to increase with time, and which are going to lead to some, uh, you will see in the, in the movie, some, uh, some strings where the galaxy will form, actually. This initially, these very tiny uh, fluctuations of temperature and density they are the core for the growth of the, of the galaxy in, this, uh, in these strings. And then you will see actually how the material is, is enriched uh, over the time. So this is uh, one of the very beautiful simulations that, uh, that you can see. So here it's, uh, you, you can start to see the, the strings. Here you, still ha you only have some, uh, some gas, you don't have stars yet. And you see this, uh, this uh, fluctuation, they lead to these uh, beautiful strings. So the matter is, is not everywhere, it's really a, a line through these, uh, through these strings. And here you start to see uh, the first galaxy which are forming, these pinkish regions. And when the galaxy start to form, you have actually some stars which start to form and which are going to uh, expel some, uh, some material. So you will see with time, you are at after 3 billion years. Huh? This, is the, this is more or less the time where you have the most star formation, the highest peak of star formation. And you see in these bubbles, these galaxies actually, because of the explosion of the supernovae, the winds of the massive star, they actually have this very strong wind, this, this uh, galactic winds, which go and, and uh, pollute the in, uh, intra-cluster uh, uh, material with, uh, with the metals. And you see these, uh, these beautiful bubbles. And this is the way the, the universe is getting enriched. This story is extremely uh, a very hot topic in astrophysics. And we have a lot of instruments which are actually making some observations of the abundances of stars in every places, not only in our galaxy, but everywhere. And then uh, we actually have all these uh, beautiful constraints. And as you know, the more constraints we have, the longest we, we come with our models and the, 
the more we have to work to, to improve the model. But this is very exciting, actually, a very, very exciting time. And of course, as I was saying, uh, you have to sell with your, your, uh, what, you, what you can. So in, the, in this field, you sell with searching for the elements of life, which is, I guess, I hope, something that was interesting for you during these lectures. So helium-3, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the two isotopes of, uh, of helium, that ha stable isotope of, uh, of helium that has uh, two protons and one neutron. Helium is here, and uh, you have here the, the amount of helium-3 that you have for helium-4 in the interstellar matter and here uh, in, the, uh, in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. To understand the story of this, uh, of this, uh, matter, of this uh, element, we will do a detour to the Moon. Strange. Why? Okay, I will tell you why. So, Apollo 11, you see this uh, beautiful picture of, uh, of uh, Buzz Aldrin in front of the American uh, flag. You, well, you know all these stories. Do you think that was the first thing that was put on the moon? What was put first on the moon? They landed. Aldrin and Armstrong, what did they do? Well, first, they throw the jettison back. So, I'm asking you, in your future, if you are envisioning a mission, please look for this jettison bag. Because it was full of their stuff, <laughs> and also the remains of their meal, actually. So it was full of bacteria, actually. Do you think that this bacteria might have survived? I don't know. I'm asking you. I'm, I'm very happy to talk with the biologists here and people looking at these kind of things during this week. It's, for me, it's really a curiosity. So could that be a mission to the moon and get this bacteria by? Probably everything is dead, but who knows? Now let's look what happened, really. So here you have the Apollo 11 that goes up. So, more garbage. Aldrin. Now they are approaching the moon, doing their stuff. Ah, here we are. You know, they had a problem to land, huh? because there had been a little push that was unexpected, so they didn't, they were not at the place where they were supposed to, bo to go, and it was really manually driven huh? uh, by Armstrong. So he was looking for a place where to land. Poor guy. Okay. So this is uh, Collins, who stays in the, in the module. And now they are landing, almost. Okay, here we go. Rocks, rocks, rocks. It's going to be okay. Come on. So you see the shadow here. Okay, a little bit of dust. Poof. Okay, here they are. First images from the ground. The shadow. The guy goes down the small step for man and blah, blah, blah. Giant leap for humanity, come on. He didn't know where he would learn, actually. Well, okay, we are close from what I wanted to show you. Okay, here we are. So he's walking on the moon.
Okay. This is Armstrong, huh? And Aldrin should come down. Come on, guys. Yes, and now look, look, look. Look what they are doing, actually. They are actually putting... Okay, but look in the back. You see this thing? Do you know what it is? So this thing, you see, was before they put the flag. So what was it? No, not the seismic, but uh, you are the person from Bern. <laughs> okay, yes, this was a solar wind experiment, and they had to put it before anything because they wanted to collect more particles, okay? So this is the solar wind experiment, and this was invented. This is why I mentioned Bern. This was invited by, by uh, Professor Geis. Uh, from Bern, who was actually, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if he was still a postdoc, but he was working at NASA at that time, and he had heard that they were looking for some experiments on the moon. And this guy was very clever, and he said, oh, it has to be less than 500 grams, let's make this experiment, which was a foil of aluminium that you could actually unroll, put on this stick, and then collect the winds of the sun, okay? And the guy was interested in that. Well, you probably know much better than me, but he was interested because in some meteorites, there were some uh, uh, alpha particles which were more abundant than uh, was expected. And the only way to have them was to have them, these alpha particles being implanted by the, by the solar wind. Is that correct? And we knew about the solar wind because we knew about uh, the, the <coughs> comets. Uh, also through the eclipse and, of course, through these uh, beautiful uh, uh, interactions with the, with, the solar, uh, with the atmospheric Earth. So the idea was to go and collect this wind. It, was, it, has, it had never been done because in, on Earth you are protected by the, by the magnetic field and the particles, they just enter at the pole. And uh, so the idea was to go and collect these, alpha, these particles from the solar wind uh, uh, on the Moon. So they got the abundances, they got some particles, there was some helium, uh, neon and argon isotopes, so they could make the isotopic ratio. So th what they did is that they collected these particles, rolled the foil, brought it back to Earth and then sent to Bern, and in Bern they were exami examining it. And they actually did it for all the Apollo missions, okay? They changed a little bit the foil, it was not aluminum anymore later, but uh, anyway. And this has given insight, as you will see, on many different topics in astrophysics. And this has led to a very uh, long uh, questioning, an enigma about the helium tree. Why helium tree was interesting at that time? It was 69. 69 uh, was a few years after the cosmic back, uh, microwave background had been found, just by chance, by Penzas and, and Wilson, and Wilson, which was one of the support of this uh, big bang nucleosynthesis. Okay, so it was interesting because it was a way to probe if some elements were made during the big bang. And here you have the prediction as a function. So these are the predictions of the abundance you can make within the big bang, depending on the uh, on the baryonic density at the time where the Big Bang nucleosynthesis occurred. And you see that the, if the, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, if the baryonic density increases, you can make more or less uh, helium. And here, this is the helium tree. Okay, so if we could go and capture these helium tree particles, which were from the wind of the sun, we would have actually a, a lower limit to the abundance that was made uh, in, in, uh, in the Big Bang. And the value was here, actually. And much later on, we had different ways to determine the abundances of the other elements in very pristine material. But on top, with this uh, uh, observation of the CMB, we could determine what was the actual baryonic density 
at that time, okay? And you see this is the value which comes from these kind of things, and you see the value that came from the, this experiment was not too far from, uh, from uh, the actual value that we have, that we think is the correct one today. So that was one thing, probing Big Bang nucleus synthesis. Actually, guys didn't even think about that at that time, that came later, but, uh, but that's very interesting. Uh, and then the second thing, We've been talking about hydrogen burning in stars. You remember? Proton, proton, make deuterium, and I capture another proton. What do I make? An helium tree. And uh, so, and this was also the time, 60s, so this was proposed in 58, but the first models were made in 67, just two years before the mission. That was also very interesting, you know, okay? Your 400 uh, grams of experiment you sell to actually uh, capture the solar wind. And uh, you do this kind of science, cosmology, stellar evolution, etc. Okay, to make a long story short, here is what you do. So this is the, the production of helium trees. So let me explain how it is. So this is the center of the star, the surface of the star. This is the mass in, within the star. And here, this is the mass fraction of helium-3 that you make through these PP reactions. So what you do is that when at, at modest temperature you make deuterium plus proton, you make helium-3. And if you go a little bit deeper, it's hotter, so helium-3 plus helium-3 decreases. So you have a peak of helium-3 within the star. And this peak uh, actually uh, changes with the mass of the star, the low mass stars that were supposed to produce a lot of helium-3. Uh, so the sun, uh, the sun would be here, actually. And the more massive stars, because they burn hydrogen through CNO, they don't make so much helium-3. And then you have the dredge up, so the convective, this is net production, and then when the star becomes a red giant, you go dredge up this uh, helium-3, bring it to the surface, and eject it in the galaxy. So far, so good, okay? But, so you do it through these phases that I've mentioned before. So now if you are doing chemical evolution models, what are you going to expect? This is time, so this would be the Big Bang with the value you get from your bionic uh, density, how much helium you will form, so something around here, and then what will happen with time? How, much, how, is, going to ev how is the helium tree going to evolve in your galaxy? You form it in low mass stars, you expel it in the interstellar medium, so you expect that it's going to increase. Okay, you take the stellar evolution models, dredge up, blah, 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 mass loss, and you predict also the lifetime of the star, and you say, okay, with time, within the galaxy, the helium tree is going to increase with time, but a lot, okay? So here I give you uh, references of many people who have computed that, using different years of different stars, computed by different people, different codes, etc. and they all found this. So you see the, the, the broadness of this thing is, is the uncertainty, but okay. So now, where was the solar wind uh, value? Well, this is very embarrassing, actually. It was here. Okay, so... What you measure in the wind of the star is, in the wind of the sun, is not the helium tree that you have made inside the sun, huh? because it has not been dredged up yet. It's the helium tree that was formed, that was there when the star formed, okay? So you have the accumulation of the previous generation, but still, you would expect that, if your model were correct, the sun would be born with a value like that. Very embarrassing. And then, if you look at other places, uh, so with Galileo, there was this, uh, this uh, quantity of helium-3 in Jupiter, and there were some uh, different, so the local interstellar matter and some very specific regions in, uh, in the galaxy. Uh, and they were all showing a very, very modest increase with time. It was really a problem that lasted for 40 years. One way would be to say, okay, maybe my nuclear reactions are wrong. I don't know, maybe it's possible to make helium-3, but then there can be a resonance maybe, 
uh, in this in this thing, which makes that helium three helium three is much faster than what I think, and maybe I destroy more. Okay, and uh, if you include this resonance in your model, this chemical evolution instead of being that would be something like that. Okay, so nuclear physicists they look, uh, and it was also the moment where we had this uh, neutrino problem. We were predicting much more neutrino from the sun than what we were seeing in, in our experiments. So people are saying, well, that must be the solution. Because if you have this, uh, this uh, reaction here, then you won't make so many neutrinos through the beryllium, and that's the solution. Okay? Well, two problems you solve at the same time. So they made some experiments, uh, several at Grand Sasso in Italy, to measure, to measure the, the cross-section, and they didn't find this resonance meaning that it was not a nuclear solution. The nuclear reaction rates we were using were correct. And in addition, later on, we found out that it was not because we didn't produce these neutrinos that we didn't capture them. It was because they were oscillating and changing nature. We would not see them, or not with the same experiments. Okay? So it was not the solution. And then, I'm going to tell you the, the solution. Again, it's a question of hydrodynamics within the star. So there were some guys who made some uh, models of a red giant, and uh, they looked, they found a very strange instability in their models. And with one of my colleagues, we tried to see what kind of instability can that be. So you have a 3D model and uh, you get something, but you don't know exactly what happens. Huh? The, the, the 3D simulation tells you something happens, but you don't know what it is. And actually what you have, if you look helium-3 plus helium-3, you make two protons and one alpha particle. So if you count the number of, L of particles that you have at the end, three particles instead of two at the beginning, that means that you're going to inverse the molecular weight. So you will have a layer where you have some uh, abundances, uh, a mixture with heavier molecular weight than below. And maybe that tells you something. I don't know if there are some people working in oceanography here, but it's an instability which is known very well in the ocean. You can do it, uh, maybe it's an experiment we could do also during the week, but uh, for example, if you put hot salty water so it's a double instability because it's not only the elements that are, are going to, to diffuse, but also the heat. So if you put hot salty water on top of fresh water and you color the hot one, you will see these beautiful salt fingers actually, which will, uh, which will come down. And this is well known in the ocean because uh, that's, a way to, uh, that's the way the, the you have this very strong circulation with, within the ocean between the hot salty water which is uh, at the equator and the regions where you have uh, less salt and the uh, material is cooler. So you have this material, this, this water which sinks below and you have actually this uh, thermal instability. And this is extremely important to understand the climate also. So of course in the stars we don't have salt, we don't have water, but we have also a way to have this kind of instability because you can inverse through these nuclear reactions the mean molecular weight and you also have some energy to some temperature that is going to 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 diffuse so here is what is it, what it does this is the evolution of uh, of helium 3 at the surface of a model so these are three models but let's look only at one of them for example the, the black one so when the star is born, it's born with the helium. This is a mass fraction of helium uh, with a very low helium abundance. Then the star in the main sequence, it makes this uh, helium tree peak, okay? And then later it becomes a red giant. So it goes, dredge up this helium tree, and you see at the surface the helium tree increases. And then if you had a model, normal model, it would stay constant here, and then you would enrich the, the galaxy with this helium tree. But now when you have actually this instability that pops up uh, within the star, you actually start to, to transport this material deeper inside the star and you burn the helium tree. And this is what you get actually through this thermoaline instability, so double diffusive instability. The helium tree that you have produced on the main sequence, you dredge, dredge it up to the envelope, but at that time when you are a giant, you are able to transport it deeper and to burn it. 
That means that at the end of the day, you have a little bit more of helium-3 in your envelope than you had when you were born, but you see it's very minute compared to what you expect from a normal model without this instability. And so if you do that, so this is with, uh, with uh, uh, classical models, and if you do that, actually, you are able to decrease very significantly the yields of helium-3, and you are actually able to reproduce the observations. So I'm proud to say that it was my PhD student, Nadej Lagarde, who actually did her thesis on this, and uh, she's uh, in Bordeaux now. She's a CNR, she has a CNRS position in Bordeaux, and this was actually the subject of her thesis. And we were very proud that uh, after 40 years of this uh, problem uh, uh, produced by men, let's say, because there were 12 men on the moon, huh? no women. And then a uh, lot of people, people working on, uh, on nuclear physics, on um, cosmology, etc. We tried, I tried also with different processes. I had another student who was not so lucky. We tried something else and it was not the solution. She still has a position now, but uh, okay. It's not so funny if you find, uh, if the answer to the question you have in your thesis is no, it's better to have yes. Okay, my hypothesis is correct, but still to say that uh, it, was, it was a lot of, of efforts and, uh, and uh, multidisciplinary effort to try to solve this. To solve it today, because uh, maybe it's not the solution. Huh? This is the solution that works today, but maybe somebody else finds something or, and, uh, and finds another solution. So we were pr very proud because from Switzerland to the moon and back, because Nadej did the thesis in Geneva, we hope we found the, the solution. And there was actually uh, this beautiful uh, uh, coin that was made for the 40th anniversary of, uh, of the, ma the 50th anniversary of the man on, of the moon. And with this, I will stop. Uh, just to finish to say that, to explain only one element, you need to include a lot of <laughs> Uh, of processes, you need to include a lot of knowledge that one person cannot, of course, handle. Uh, nuclear physics, uh, all these processes within the star, etc. So it's, it's really fully pluridisciplinary and disciplinarity and collaborations, etc. Uh, and uh, so I hope that you will have this chance of doing these things uh, during your career. But I guess in exobiology, it's so, and also being here at this school shows that uh, this uh, pluridisciplinarity is extremely, extremely uh, important in science. And I will conclude on that. Thank you for your attention.